The gospel lesson uh, for this morning is from St. John's Gospel, the fourth chapter, <clears throat> beginning at the fifth verse. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? And then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot, he, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Here ends the reading. Perhaps some of you have been in uh, workshops or other kinds of training things where you've worked or maybe in school or some of you have had this experience in churches too. And so um, when a lot of these kinds of sessions get going, you know they have the um, icebreaker things, you know what I'm talking about? They propose something and then everybody goes around the circle and shares what they're thinking. Have you ever done this? You could tell some of you have and some of you are saying, oh no, we're not gonna do that now. Well, what's important is the question that's asked and uh, when we've done Bible study in, uh, on Wednesday nights, which we're gonna continue again this Wednesday night for those of you who want to be there, we want to often use the serendipity Bibles and the serendipity Bible has a coffee cup thing in the, in the margin, so that's how you start the session off to warm everybody up, you know. So like, here's one of the questions. To what tree or plant would you compare your life? A weeping willow? Bending with the wind? An evergreen, tall and majestic? A desert cactus, a sole survivor? An oak tree, a bit nutty? Uh, here's another one. If you could rename yourself, what new name would you pick? 
When you were a kid, I bet you didn't like your name, right? Most of us would like that. What do you give me that name for, Mom? Then Mom told me the other name they were thinking of, and I was glad I got the one I got. <laughs> At any rate, you've all had those experiences. Um, here's another question. Not counting relatives, who gave you your first kiss? Yeah, uh-oh, is right, Earl. Is right, uh, now minds are going to be wandering off left and right about where that was. <clears throat> For me, it was Judy Martin. I had to knock her down in the schoolyard to kiss her. I don't know. Or what type of bread are you today? What type of bread are you? Are you all natural? Are you rye? Are you moldy? Are you crusty? Are you fresh? Are you easy to butter up? Well, anyway, you would share those kinds of things around a group and then everybody would laugh and some people, and some people, quite frankly, uh, if they're in a bad place in their life, sometimes these questions give them permission to open up and to say things about where they are in life that lead to deeper discussion, some things that are very tough for them. And that simple truth that these thoughts, these silly kinds of questions sometimes can lead to much bigger things in our hearts and minds is one of the reasons why we come together here. We come together to have a good time and to celebrate. We also come together to think about deeper things, bigger things, things that are more important than even our own lives. The story of the woman at the well is a story that has many layers of meaning. Um, there's character here struggling with life's most important issues. There's a person struggling with decisions about her life. And although these may be the quiet things, maybe they're the things, if, if you're anything like me, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night or even before you can even get to sleep, you've got things going on in your head and you can't get rid of them. They are going over, you're going over and over these things, these deep things. And you have to be careful how we, we have to be careful how we talk to ourselves then because sometimes we can be digging ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole. But often these are the questions we need to be dealing with. And that's why uh, Morton Kelsey, who is a uh, uh, Christian author, was a professor at Notre Dame for many years, has often said that the Holy Spirit often speaks to us in our dreams. And so those wake those dreams and those awake moments, too, are important to us. And we compare ourselves to the characters in the Bible, you know? We look at these biblical characters and we wonder why are they in, the, what, in these stories? Why are these the people that encounter Jesus of all the hundreds, thousands of people? It could have been, stories could have been told about. They told about these certain people, like this Samaritan woman at the well. What is there about her life that speaks to your life and mine. Jesus' opening line is kind of simple. Please give me a drink. Actually, he didn't even say please. Give me a drink. And her response to this simple request, um, the woman doesn't realize that when she starts to speak to him, she's taking a step into eternity. She is offered a gift of understanding and an acceptance that only God can give. And she is encountering this one who tells us who God is. Can you imagine if you were invited into a room and when you got in the room, somehow you realized that the person you were speaking to was Jesus. And that whatever you asked or whatever you wanted to talk about or whatever was on your mind was why he was there to be with you. Well, that's the kind of experience this woman has. And this story is a good story because, first of all, there's all kinds of barriers set up. There's all sorts of barriers why this conversation shouldn't even happen. Jesus is a Jew and she is a Samaritan. And Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They had worship differences. Like many of us Christians, Boy, there are a lot of different uh, worship styles, aren't there? And of course, we all know who's right and who's wrong. All you have to ask is somebody will tell you, well, you know, we're really the ones who do this right. And you ought to get with it. It's that old story, we've mentioned it before, you know, St. Peter showing somebody around heaven, say, walk quietly past this door. Those are the Baptists. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> and although that's funny, 
We know that that's the way we have thought about things. Is that any way to do communion? Why did they do it that way? Why don't they sing these songs and on and on? So that was one barrier, a barrier which we still have, unfortunately. Then there's the man and woman barrier. In a society that was male dominated, of course, this is a barrier. We're told that when the disciples come back, they say, why is he speaking to that woman? Why is he speaking to that woman? There's still some people who think that way, you know? There's still some people who think feminism was absolutely and totally wrong, didn't have anything good to say to our society, and was a total mess. Unless you're a woman. Then your thinking is a bit different. So that's another barrier. And the worship issues we've already talked about. And quite frankly, when it comes to our ability to take in God and to take the banquet, I would say, that God offers us, most often Christian people choose McDonald's. <laughs> no, I don't think I'll take the banquet. I think I'll go to McDonald's. Then I know what I'm going to get. I'm telling you, if you know what you're going to get, it's not from God. Because by very virtue of the fact that God gives you this stuff, gives me this stuff, we don't know what it is. If we knew what it was, we didn't, we wouldn't need God. Adrian von Kamm, who is a, a Catholic priest and an author, um, I think a really wonderful author, says, no greater gift can be given to people than the presence of persons who allow them to be themselves. Most of us started off life not allowed to be quite ourselves, right? You had parents who had an idea of who you should be, right? Some of that is still affecting you. Sometimes you are still hearing those messages from mom or dad or grandma or whoever it was that was saying to you, no, this is the person you should be. And you spend your whole life and me struggling to be the person who we think we should be. And how many times in this, among the people in this room does something come out of your mouth and you say, that was my mother, that was my father. I swore I'd never say that. That's what Jesus is trying to do with this woman and in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Say, be the person you're supposed to be with God. That's all. Everything else kind of is commentary. So Jesus breaks down all these barriers and he opens this woman's heart. The discussion opens up this woman's possibilities in her own life, possibilities she never imagined. Living water? I mean, there needs to be more here. You know, I've often said, there's a lot of filling in the lies. This isn't the way this discussion went, literally. There must be a lot more stuff that was spoken about here. What does living water mean? What does it mean for you? What is possible in your life that needs the washing and the refreshment the thirst quenching of living water. Everyone in this room needs it, has looked for it, and maybe sometimes we've even found it. Five husbands. This is one of the interesting things. This is the kind of thing you could get on television, right? She's got five husbands, and the one she has now isn't her husband. Ooh, this is very bad. This is very bad. It's hard for us to think positively about this woman. We frown on this kind of stuff, don't we? If you are introduced by a friend to someone else and that friend says to you, I want you to meet uh, Sheila over here. Um, she's had five husbands. You say, Oof. there's all kinds of things that go through your mind. Or this is Ben, come over here and meet Ben. He's had five wives. So obviously there's something wrong with these people, right? They're not allowed to be themselves in our own minds and our stories until we find out what's on the inside of these people. We kind of shrink away. The amazing thing about, the, one of the amazing things about this story is this woman doesn't shrink away from Jesus. She doesn't uh, engage the shame that she might have about having an unsuccessful set of relationships. That doesn't come to her at all. She stays engaged with Jesus. 
Most of us, quite frankly, if we are called down for some of our past mistakes, and there are always people who want to remember you by the worst thing you ever did, Whatever the worst thing you ever did, that's what they remember you by. What a terrible way to live. She doesn't shrink away. She stays engaged. Because it's a this day thing that Jesus is really talking about. She could have hidden herself away and risked no more. We've all done that. Oh, wait, I don't want to get involved in that conversation because I don't like where that's going. But the truth about her life is now in the open. It's a symbol that Jesus opens up all of her life, not just the issue of her relationships, but he's opening up everything. What does she feel deeply about? Does she need forgiveness? I'd like to bet she did. She, does she need some healing in this painful life? Years ago, I found out that uh, my mother, my father's was my mother's third husband. She got married very young to a man who beat her. And my grandfather brought her home. And this very young man, before he was 20 years old, died of cancer. So then she married another man. And that man beat her. And so she kicked him out. And you know, <laughs> after two husbands like that, my mother got it. You ever had that experience? You know, I've been doing this wrong for a while. I think I'm going to stop doing this wrong. I think I'm going to do this right this time. And so she married my father, who was a very gentle and kind person, although every once in a while he'd spout off and foul language would fly out of his mouth like you couldn't believe it, but I can't repeat that here. But generally he was a very, very gentle man. So Jesus is trying to heal this woman. He's trying to see for her that life has other possibilities. And then he says to her, I am the Messiah. And what to me that means is, let me show you who I am. Let me tell you who I am. And let me tell you that life is open to you now because you're talking to me. And I think for Jesus, when he talked to someone and he realized he was fully engaged with this other person and this other person was listening and he was listening to that person, I think Jesus' hopes got raised to the highest level. His hope was that this person would be a microcosm of the whole world as God made it to be. This person would be forgiven and loved. This person would see possibilities they had never seen before. This person will understand what true life is and how to be peaceful and just and hopeful. And he saw that in each person and in this person. He gives this woman a new image of herself. She is now accepted by God. She is now accepted by God. It's a new self-image. We all need that. There are all, for each one of us here, I believe there are parts of our lives that we know is not acceptable in many places. And maybe even you feel it's not acceptable to God, and Jesus is saying that's wrong. You are acceptable to God. And so then we are told in verse 28, the woman runs to tell the people in the city about her encounter with Jesus. And she says, this can't be the Messiah, can it? She wonders. The way he was, the way he talked, the way I felt when I was around him, the promises he makes. Can he be the Messiah? Because that's what the Messiah would do. You see, whatever her decision was at that moment, and we're not clear what that is, whatever she became after that, she was never the same. Because the idea of this kind of God and this acceptance and this power in the midst of life, this idea is now let loose in her world and it changes everything for her. She can never go back to being the person she used to be. And then others believed because of her testimony. So that idea got into their heads and into their hearts. And so... Did they see the light of God in her eyes? Maybe they did. Maybe they saw the light of God in that woman's eyes. The question is, do others see the light of God in your eyes? 
Amen. Will you please rise now and receive the benediction? May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. God bless us always. Amen.